<laughs> Welcome to the Unnamed Youth Podcast. If we rebrand, that'll happen just randomly as we go. Yeah, I don't in know. the future. Yeah. Okay, we are starting a new year, and so we're doing a new thing on the podcast. And what we wanted to do is, as we were teaching through the story of the Bible, um, we kept coming to passages where we realized that there's just like really complicated stuff that we don't have time, and it's not really suitable for a teaching. Um, and so we wanted to move those conversations here. And so even today, this is, it's Wednesday. You're teaching tonight. I am. I'm like trying to wrap my head around what we're doing. Um so we're going to record these before whoever teaches teaches so that we kind of know what's going to be on here and we can talk about the stuff before the teaching happens and then we're going to release it after the teaching. Friday. Yes. So this should be Friday when you're listening to it. Yeah. And you should have already heard Gabby teach unless you're a high schooler and then don't listen to this yet. Secrets. Yeah. Spoilers. So what we're doing, uh, it's a little bit different. So how we're going to do this is one of, <laughs> are you like nervous about what I have? Yeah. This is like a secret agenda. I don't know what I, I, I kind of know what we're going to talk about, but I don't know exactly how we're going to talk about it. That's true. So um, the topic for today is, a lot of it is creation and evolution, because that's a huge topic around um, Genesis 1 and 2, and that's what Gabby is teaching on today. Um, and so because she's teaching, I kind of come up with how we're going to talk about it and what we're going to talk about. Um, I have the show notes. I have like an outline. The first, number one, is to welcome everyone. Welcome. Welcome. And then I put something fun and engaging. <laughs> Something fun and engaging. And I never I never decided what that was. Okay. I'll I'll use um the icebreaker question that I wrote for small groups. Oh perfect. If you were to create a new animal, what would it be? Describe it. Where would it you live? Have to, you, what would it eat? Do you know your answer already since no. you wrote it? Oh. I've never seriously thought about this ever once I in my life. Create a new animal. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna like put it together as a yep, I'm just gonna like yep, verbally yeah, put it verbally together. It. So it's gotta be able to fly. Okay. And it has to be big and strong enough for me to ride it. Okay. Because that immediately gives it some utility. Mm-hmm. Um it has I would say like the personality of a golden retriever. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe a little more like verbalizing. I don't wanna like they can fully talk. talk. I don't know if I wanna <laughs> I think an animal that talks would just be really creepy. Yeah. Thinking of like parrots and stuff. I'm envisioning Buckbeak. From Harry Potter right now, based on what you've just yeah, described. less temperament. Buckbeak does not yeah, have the personality yeah, of a golden not retriever. A, not a gold, well, but he's like a golden retriever to it. The people who are nice to him. But that's not a golden retriever. Yeah, a golden yeah. retriever is nice to everybody. So yeah, kind of like Buckbeak, um, like a flying golden retriever. Yeah, but I think strong enough to be able to defend me would be cool too. Okay. So the purpose yeah, of this a, animal is very much centered around me being able to fly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be able to go wherever I want to go. Yeah. 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 Okay. I guess you said design an animal. You didn't say that it would be my pet or do what I wanted, right? You just said design. I don't know. It's if I could design any you animal. You can interpret that however you want, I guess. Okay. Or I'd make like platypus part two and pick like five different just random. Yeah. Just like roll dice. Hodge. Yeah. Yeah. Put animals together. But it, that's like every Pokemon now. So oh. that's all they do, it seems. Oh. I'm not familiar with okay, any uh, Pokemon lore, let alone any recent Pokemon lore. But oh, okay. well, that's what they are. Okay, okay, what about you? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I I don't find these questions interesting. My to sure. answer, because I th- I think lots of people do, and oh, okay. and it's like fun for lots of people, but I don't know. It's not fun for me. Okay, first then I'll help you like narrow it down. Would you make okay. like a nice animal or a bad animal? Oh, a nice animal. Of okay. course, of course. A nice animal. See, all that I can picture is like a dog. Like that's, I would make a nice dog. Like a new dog. That I love. And that would be the perfect pet. What if it was like as fluffy as a sheep? Mm. But the mobility and the personality of a dog. Well, maybe. But I don't know. Sheep get like. Oh, really gross. Yeah. Well, and they can get like hurt. So would you make an animal that... Oh, yeah. That's the dumbness of a sheep, though. Yeah. yeah. Not the personality or the intelligence of a sheep. (laughs) No, no. But I mean, like, hurt from, like, all the fur. Like, because you have to, like, clip their fur, like, really regularly. Or they, like, can't walk. Okay. So as fuzzy as a sheep, but its fur takes care of itself. Yes. Yeah. A self-grooming... Hypoallergenic, (laughs) non-shedding. Basically a pillow. That's your friend. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That would be my animal. That's a good animal. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that was fun okay, and that engaging. Was fun. <laughs> I don't know if that was engaging, but okay. So here 
is, I don't know if you're going to look through it. Maybe I should I should have given it to you like in a slide so that it got revealed piece by piece. Oh, okay. I will I will fold it up then and I will not. No, look. that's okay. You can look. <laughs> you won't know. No, I tried no, to be I'm a little bit cryptic. Okay. I tried to be kind of cryptic. But, okay. Um, okay. So the first part is to recap your teaching just a little bit to discuss, to remind them of what you talked about. And since I haven't heard it yet, to tell me a little bit about what you're going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So... Oh, this is weird to think about that people are listening to it in the future because I my instinct is to be like, oh, well, I can't say yet because they have to listen tonight. Um, but yeah, so we talked about um, God versus Marduk a little bit, which is your first point. Um, but we looked at the Babylonian creation epic um, and thought about the kind of cultural message that it sent about um, both kind of the creation of the world and then how life works, um, what what the role of like spiritual beings are, gods, so-called gods are, um, and then what humans' role are. And then we looked at that and used it to kind of contrast how Genesis um, talks about the creation of the world, specifically about who God is. So um, we thought about his intentionality and power in creation. We saw that like um, Genesis 1 is filled with God said X, and then it was so, and God said this, and then it was so. So, like, over and over again, um, we see that God is totally in power, like, over what he creates, how he creates. Um, creation doesn't come from, like, some bloody conflict, um, when, like, what happens in the Babylonian narrative. It's, like, creation is kind of just this, like, accidental byproduct of of this, like, violent conflict between these other gods. Um, but we see that the God of the Bible is is not like that. Um, he has purpose and intentionality and care in what he creates. Um, and then the pinnacle of that creation is um, humanity, humans, Adam and Eve. Um, and he he creates them um, not like how the Babylonian gods create to, to clean up essentially their mess from their own fight, um, but instead he creates humans um, to generously share his creation with and to um, invite them into relationship with him so that they can work together to make the world even better and even better and continuously get better and better and better. And we saw that that's like, that's the Bible's first picture of what heaven is. It's God and humans working together um, and life keeps getting better. That's really cool. Wow, you just summarized your teaching. Does that feel good? To yeah, be able yeah. to summarize your teaching, no notes, no anything. You just yeah, like, no. Ready? I'm I'm impressed. I did that without notes, but yeah. cool. I'm excited to hear that fleshed out because um, I haven't heard it yet. I'm in the past still. Um, okay, so that's what was covered in the teaching, and so we want to talk about creation and evolution because that's just a big topic. But yeah, that's way too much to talk about in a teaching. Um, and I wanted to start to talk talking about how. When we read the Bible, right, a lot of times we've talked about this on Wednesday nights all the time, but what we want to do is kind of like transport ourselves back into the ancient world, which I'm sure you're going to cover tonight, mm -hmm. and try to think about like how, how was this written and was this communicated to the original audience, to the people that God was talking to. And so we have this God versus Marduk kind of like set up. And the reason I want to talk about that first is I think we go into the story and again, I don't know what you're going to talk about tonight. So you can tell me, oh, I already talked about that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. And then we can just move on. Um, we come into it with a creation versus evolution on our mind already. Yep. yep. Like that's just, yep. I feel like, how we read it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to talk about that tonight? Super briefly. Like okay. that's how I set up this podcast is oh, by okay. saying that essentially. Perfect. Do you have, yeah. Then do you have more thoughts since you've been studying, researching, getting ready that you're not going to be able to say tonight about that? About like the framework that we have? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when we... When we come to the text, we always have this like um, this framework of like science um, in in our minds because I think, and I remember this growing up, like in school, being taught that essentially the scientific method is like basically the only objective way to arrive at any kind of truth. Um, so we have this like framework that's been given to us, kind of the scientific method, and then um, there's there's two pieces in that. Like one is we try and a lot of times apply like the scientific method to reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also, since we have like such a strong um, message about science and the importance of science and those are, science is great. Yeah, so we see all the benefits no, of it as well. <laughs> we have yeah. no beef with science. Um, but, but then when we hear like a lot of like the scientific community have a certain conclusion or understanding about how the world came to be, then when we come to the Bible, then it seems like, okay, are, are science and Bible in, confl in conflict with each other? Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a, 
that's a really like confusing tension that that we have to sit with in our as modern readers mm-hmm. that the original audience would not have even thought about. Nope. Yeah. 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 And then I think that's why I wanted to highlight starting there is um, it's our conviction, both of our conviction, that the Bible was not interested in this discussion. Like it's something that we come to the text with and go, because of where we are in the 21st century, we're asking these kind of questions that they just weren't asking or interested in. So it doesn't mean it's not a good conversation to have. It just means um, this text wasn't designed to answer that question. So the reason that is important is it's similar to, um, we, we say often that the Bible is written for us, but not to us. So imagine you're going to maybe one of the gospels or a letter that Paul writes to a church. That's probably even a better example. And you go to one of these letters and you see Paul say something to this community. Um, you can't imagine, oh, okay, Paul's writing that literal exact thing to me. You have to remember, oh, he's writing that to somebody because something happened. So then how would I apply that to my life? Like maybe I'm not going through the same situation that church was going through or that those people were going through. And so what do I do? Um, I think, <laughs> to use a dumb example off the top of my head, um, Paul writes to Timothy because Timothy's having stomach problems. That's a common one brought up. Yeah. Drink a little wine because your stomach isn't feeling great. And in those days, like water wasn't clean. It was really hard to come by healthy water, which we take totally for granted. Um, And so normally like something fermented or some kind of like drink would then be safer. Um, And so wine wasn't the same it was now. Like there's all these weird things, but you can't go to that text and be like, hey, look, Paul's telling me to drink wine. Like that's what the Bible says. I should drink wine. Like you'd go and say, oh, for some reason he's instructing. (laughs) Are you like? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Everyone with stomach issues reads that passage and says, oh, my solution from God. Is to drink. Has arrived. Yeah. Yeah, I have the flu. I am going to drink only wine while I have the flu. Like, that'd be a terrible reading of that passage. I mean, so we we instinctively get this with other passages. But the important part, the important thing to remember is the text wasn't written to us, but it is for us. So we can go to it. We can ask it really good questions. We can learn from it. um, But we have to remember, like, what's it trying to teach us? And then kind of keep our scope within that, I think, for the certainty that we want. Mm -hmm. And then just be wary the further away we get of its original intention. Now, unfortunately, the Bible does not come with an original intention, like footnote. Um, It doesn't tell us this is the reason this was written or um, anything. And so we have to do a lot of work. So as I was thinking about this, it's not in the notes, but I was thinking about how, um, and this is coming back a little bit, but we are losing long, and you've heard me say this many times, we're losing long form types of storytelling and learning. And so our world is being kids trained. Kids these days. I know. Kids no attention days. span. But it's even like, it was with my culture, it was like even way before mine, it's been hundreds of years where it's slowly been happening and yep. technology increases it. And the idea of what I'm trying to get to is we are learning to take in information in slower or like smaller and smaller chunks. So we expect to learn something in a very short period of time. Like you want to watch an eight minute highly edited video to understand this like super complicated topic that took thousands of years for people to like figure out and name. And that just makes certain things difficult. When you're used to understanding something really quickly, you can come to something like the Bible and you can expect it to do that same thing. You can go, oh, I should come to Genesis 1 and I should be able to read it and immediately understand the simplest, clearest way that it should be understood. And that's just, that's a framework that we come to it with is Mm -hmm. that's how it should work. Like that's how when you write a news article, you wouldn't write it and make it really confusing and be like, oh, you need to read it eight times to understand what's happening. Uh, but then I think of a famous uh, movie director, Christopher Nolan. Like I feel like he's given a window into movies that you watch. And there's a lot of other, um, he's just the most popular of this style. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's certain movie directors that make a film and you're almost not supposed to understand it right away. Yeah. I don't know if you can think of any other movies off the top of your head. or He's like, I took the most famous one. So I'm trying to think of some other films that, um, yeah. I mean, or shows. Not, not that like, not that you're explicitly maybe not supposed to understand, but I, I think there's lots of examples of media where um, on second watch, there's a deeper appreciate, like yep. you understand smaller nuances, references, like things that are building up to like the climax that you're, you already have the knowledge of of where it's going so that you can notice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, Chris. Anything Nolan. with a twist as well. Yeah. Yep. Any movie or show with a twist where you all of a sudden are like, whoa, I did not see that coming. If you watch it again, suddenly you're going to be like, Oh, if it was a good, yeah. you know, be like, oh, that was in there the whole time. Like, I just didn't notice it. And so they're designed. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of different media. Not as much as Christopher Nolan, because Christopher Nolan does try to make you like, confused. Um, but the point is, there's, there's examples in our world of media where you're not supposed to understand it right away, but the more you watch it, the more you learn about it, the deeper it gets. And we think the Bible is like that, where 
the more you read it, the more you learn about it, the deeper it'll get. So, um, okay, so all that to jump into creation versus creation, I can't even like say it, versus evolution. Um, so that's the framework I think a lot of us come to Genesis 1 with, is we kind of come in and we go like, okay, who's right? Which one do I do? Um, and I think, students, you might be coming with different perspectives. I think sometimes people can come to it with, um, I'm on one of these sides, and I want to make sure that the other side is proven wrong. Like, I want to make sure that I'm right. And so you come kind of come in a little bit hot, like ready to, to fight or to argue. Um, I think some people can also come to it with one of those stances set in their mind and I think this especially happens on probably the evolution side, where you come in and you go, I believe in science or evolution. And so I'm listening to find out, should I believe in the Bible? Like, is it going to line up with it? Because we're teaching from the Bible, right? Like, yeah, if we were in a science sure. room, it would go the opposite direction. Right. Um, but because of where we are. And so it just gets really tricky and messy. And something else that ends up coming with that is that makes it really emotional. Like, when you come in and you kind of already align yourself with a side or a position, what that means is, is sometimes in our hearts or in our minds, what we do is we think, um, if whatever said or whatever I learn disagrees with where I'm at right now, uh, that threatens me. Like that's worrisome or what do I do now? Like you can kind of have these um, really disorienting moments. Um, and I want to encourage you that those are actually healthy moments. Um, I've been very disoriented while reading the Bible many times. I don't know if you have. Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of times where I read something and maybe it's a text where I'm like, oh, that's in there. Like, I never realized the Bible has this really weird story or messy story. Um, or it's just somebody explaining really well, hey, here's all these things in the Bible and what they mean. And maybe you've never noticed this before. And that's different than what I had thought. And it almost takes me a while, like those frameworks we talked about, where I'm like, whoa, I have to like spend some time and rethink through stuff that I've I've known yeah. to put that back together again. But I think an example that, is not related to the Bible, but I remember in like um, freshman like biology or chemistry classes that I was in, being told explicitly by professors, you were probably taught X in high school about Punnett squares or like mm -hmm. how the structure of like an atom or like a molecule is. Um, that wasn't actually accurate. Like, and, and then they basically, and then they dive into something like, way more mm -hmm. complicated that I couldn't have possibly understood when I was in my 15-year-old self. Yep. Sophomore biology class. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, yeah, reading the Bible can be like that sometimes. Sometimes not even because um, of like something that you learn, but sometimes it's even like because of a life experience that you have. Um, where yeah. And then you read something in scripture and suddenly it speaks into something that like you've actually like lived and experienced and it's, yeah, yeah, it hits very different then. Yeah. I mean, I think like any kind of loss is like that. Yeah. Um, you can read passages about mourning or loss, but when you've experienced it, it just hits really different. Um, I think like as I'm a dad now, and so being a parent, all those passages about parenting or how God right. sees us, like yeah. they're just very different when I think about um, being a dad myself and having kids. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of stuff where life experiences ends up playing in. So how we read the Bible, like we bring ourselves to the Bible is, is really what we're trying to get at. Um, so I just want to maybe let you take a minute. Uh, maybe you're listening to this while you're doing something so you can't pause it. Maybe you're watching it and you have a chance, but, um, I would just ask you reflect, like think a little bit about where you come into this conversation with. Is there a lot of emotion already? Are you really worried maybe about what we're going to say, what we're not going to say? Um, and just be mindful of that. Be aware that you're bringing yourself to the story. And that's a good thing. Like we want you to bring yourself to it, mm -hmm. but just maybe yeah. think through what that means. So here we go. Uh, I kept keep saying, here we go. I don't have like, there's not a moment where I lay it down. Um, I'm like, uh, yeah, all this stuff. So, okay. So when I think of creation and evolution, I was doing a lot of different, a lot of study. I mean, there's like, there is limitless reading and studying. I yeah, feel like you people are this. really passionate about this, which means there's a yes. lot of information about it yeah. out there. Um, and our, our, well, I don't know, you prepared this, so I, I won't speak for you. But you've done a ton of studying, research, reading yourself. Right, right. And our hope is not to like synthesize all of the viewpoints and perspectives and research that has been no. done on these two topics because that would be impossible. You would not watch this podcast. It would take way too long. Yeah. Um. So, so if this is something like, this is something that you are further interested in. Like there's there's a wealth of people who have talked about this um, mm -hmm. and that's that's all good and fine. And we'll have some thoughts on how to go about yeah. like yeah. learning about this because it is really important. But um, yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, 
But yeah, so so as I was studying and researching, um, I started to notice something that I was what I was trying to do. This I'll give you a little of my methodology. So I've learned about this before. I've studied it before. Um, I am not from the sciences. Oh yeah, so that's a, that's what that C sciences versus non sciences. Sciences versus non sciences. So. Yeah. I'll admit when I come to this text that um, I don't feel much of a burden. And part of that is because I'm not in the sciences. Right. Like I think, um, as I was thinking about it, I was like, my my bent in this conversation, just to be forward with all of you, is I don't care. <laughs> like I know that sounds really <laughs> horrible. Um, I'm a pastor. Um, I've never really been super into the sciences. And so for most things, it just doesn't matter. Like it doesn't change what I'm going to do. And I've told um, students, I've told you this before, of where a friend of mine, when I was a, a really new Christian, and he took the Bible. I've used this example before. He took the Bible and he said, Justin, this is the amount, this is the part of the Bible that talks about how God or, or that God created the earth and everything in it. And this is the part of the Bible. There's a bunch of maps in here, so it's not, there we go. Kind of accurate. He said, this is the part of the Bible that talks about God wanting to be with you and be with his people which is the one you think we should focus on? And I'm like, oh, that's a really good point. And so I feel like that framework has been in my mind as I go to the Bible of going, like, that's not what the Bible's trying to answer and I'm not in the sciences, so it doesn't change my life one way or another, like ever. There's never a time in my life where I'm like, it matters. Um, but there's a lot of people who it does. Yeah. And they're in the sciences. And you have a little bit of that knowledge, I think, from your background in school, right? Yeah. It's like a taste of it. Yeah. Should I, should I share that? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know how much time you have. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if people know this about me, but I, my freshman year and like my whole life, I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a chemical engineer and I was going to move to Paris and work in the perfume industry. That was like my plan <laughs> okay. from sixth I, grade on. <laughs> that answers so many questions. I've always known you wanted to be an engineer and I thought like, I never knew it was to make perfume. <laughs> that changes everything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was my plan. Um, and then I went to college <laughs> and I spent a year studying chemical engineering and like it was fine. I didn't hate it. I didn't really love it. So then my second semester freshman year, I was like, well, maybe I'm more interested in like the medical realm, um, maybe in like pharmaceuticals. So I was like, maybe. So I just switched my major to biochemistry. So I spent my freshman year like very immersed in like the science world and like the mm -hmm. academia like science world so i mean i think a lot of times like college especially like secular colleges get portrayed as like in the science realm being like you have to deny the existence of god and like yeah. that that wasn't my experience oops um that wasn't necessarily my experience but like there very much was like a a culture and understanding of like most people around me were not christians and the information that was being presented like didn't send most people into like a like a, a spiral of like questioning their world beliefs. Hmm. And and I, I wouldn't say that that happened for me necessarily. Um, but it did suddenly become something that I was like in contact with a lot of the times. And if I was going to share with my peers that I was a Christian, um, there was like a certain level of like kind of confusion or maybe it seemed like I had some kind of cognitive dissonance hmm. going on. You felt like you did or they thought you did? I think they they probably thought that I did. Um, did I, you? I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> um, I specifically remember my my first semester I was in um, like an honors like um, seminar. Um, so it was like a smaller group and it was more like roundtable discussion. And it was about like science and like ethics in science. Um, and I like I remember we all had to like talk about our worldview and like what beliefs we were coming from. So I don't know if I was the only person in that room that was a Christian, but I was the only person in that room who shared that I was a Christian. So, um, well done. Yeah. Yeah. That's a terrifying like, yeah. moment. Yeah, it was. It was really scary. <laughs> Did everyone like stop what they were doing and look at you? Uh, no, no. Uh -oh. It like, it probably wasn't as scary as I thought it was, but it, it felt like a really scary thing to do. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Hmm. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I was around these conversations a lot. I wouldn't say that I was like super directly in them all the time, but yeah. um, there was definitely like an air about it. Hmm. And there, one of the videos I was watching um, from one of the org an organization that talks about um, science and creation, all those different things. Um, it was talking about how that's what a lot of teenagers do is they compartmentalize. And so they kind of have like, well, this is my like youth group understanding of things. And this is my like school understanding of things. And you don't really spend a lot of time trying to even put them together as much as you just kind of go like, well, when I'm here, I'm going to do this. When I'm here, I'm going to do that. Right. And I'm just going to kind of say what I'm told to say at the right time. And I don't really know how to put them together. So you do end up with like cognitive, cognitive dissonance 
is a famous or a oh, famous yeah, uh, probably a fancy a fancy term um, just means like in your mind there's a there's disagreement or there's like two different ideas that you're holding and there, you don't even think about how to put them together and so you just believe two things that maybe don't fit together but you don't even think about how they fit together you just kind of feel that they don't and that's kind of what cognitive dissonance is um, so I was looking at these diff- so I, I went into it and um, what I tried to do is I tried to look, generally there are two different sides, right? The two main sides we're going to talk about when it comes to creation evolution um, is a theistic evolution, which means that these people believe the Bible and they believe in God, but they believe that God used evolution to create everything. Um, and then the other side would be like six-day creationists or young earth, sometimes it's called. Um, and so these would be people who believe the Bible, they believe science, and they don't think that science actually proves evolution. They think that the Bible is a better place to stand because it's firmer for how the world is created. And then we look at science with that as our beginning place. So as I was like, I was going back and forth, watching videos, reading articles between these kind of two main sides, and there's nuances to each of them. Like you'll find variation in each of those sides on different right. things. But um, one of the things that I noticed that was tragic um, was their methodology seems to be this. I'll try to give you like a, and if you're familiar with one of the sides, you probably know this well. Um, what will happen on the creationism side? So creationism means that they believe God created the world in six days, as it said, and science can be looked at and used to reinforce that. What ends up happening is creationists attack science. So they attack evolutionary theory. They basically say, like, they, they critique. So they critique science all the time. They'll sit there and like, that's kind of their methodology. They'll go, the Bible clearly states it was six days. So if science is telling us this, it's got to be wrong. Let's critique science and show that science isn't actually right. And then what evolutionary creationists do is they basically critique biblical study of creationists. So what they do is they kind of attack the Bible. Not necessarily the Bible itself, but the biblical method. So they'll look at creationists and say, you're not reading the Bible correctly. You're not seeing its nuance. Um, you're reading it very literally, which isn't applicable to this passage. And so what ends up kind of happening is, is you get this feeling of destruction. Like it's both sides just kind of like not building up what we could believe or what we should believe in, but it really is like attacking the other side. I mean, it's, I think of the election right now. Um, I know hmm. none of you can vote. But you can't watch if maybe you're wealthy enough to have zero ads on anything. I'm not, or I just <laughs> refuse. I don't know. But like anywhere you go, like I'm running at the Y and I see the subtitles of all the different ads. And sometimes that's what political like season feels like is everybody just telling about how terrible the other people are and that's all you hear. Right. And so sometimes that's how evolution, like the evolution creation conversation can feel is basically just both sides telling us how stupid the other side is or how wrong. Or yeah, maybe not stupid, but... I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. I don't know. Like, how do I, yeah. yeah, yeah. And for that reason, it becomes like super emotionally charged because I, I think a lot of times um, it does feel like there's like a lot at stake because as Christians, I, I don't think anyone ever wants to like undermine the authority of the Bible. Um, and then when it becomes this attack, like it, it essentially becomes an attack of like how you see or don't see the Bible. Um, and then I think that, because yeah, like you said, I mean, both sides essentially just say to each other, you you don't actually know how to read your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's like a really, that's a really hard thing to like be told. Um, so, so of course you're going to want to jump to the defense of, of yep. that statement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what's fascinating is in all the resources, I didn't see creation, creationists argue as much about biblical method. Like their conversation was kind of like, it's pretty clear the Bible, it says six days. And what they spend a lot of their energy on is actually disproving evolution. Right. So like the creationists are using science and the evolutionary creationists are using the Bible. That's what was kind of fascinating was the like creationary evolutionists who um, they believe that evolution is how God made the world. They don't spend as much time discussing how he did that as much as they do explaining their biblical method for how that could fit in. So that's what was just really interesting. Like the sure. resources yeah, yeah. seemed really weighted one way or another. Um, but yeah, in general, it was just sad that it was so much conflict. Um, and I feel like I feel that when I talk to people who are on one side or the other, there is a lot of emotion and a lot of mm -hmm. weight to it. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so what are we going to do? I don't even know how much time. We don't have a ton more time. So you're probably wondering, Justin, Gabby, when are you going to tell us which one we should believe? Well, we're far enough into the podcast to tell you we won't. We won't, uh, yeah. <laughs> Gabby knew that. She didn't even need to see the notes to tell you. We're not going to tell you. Um, 
because um, as a church and as a, we were part of the EFCA, this is not something that we believe you have to have a certain stance on in order to be a Christian. Um, so we don't think that you have to believe one way or another to be, yeah, somebody who loves Jesus and follows him. We yeah. we do affirm a literal Adam and Eve, yep. though. Um, yeah. So we do That's affirm true. that Adam and Eve were literal people. Um, and a lot of the reasoning behind why we kind of land on that uh, affirmation um, actually comes from the New Testament, mm-hmm. um, where Paul talks a lot about um, the relationship that humans have with Adam and how that interplays with our relationship with Jesus. Where is that in the New Testament? Romans. Romans? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Five, I believe. Four or five. Yeah. So I think it's Romans five. Oh, yeah. you can hear me turning my pages. Yeah. So, Ooh. so we we do want to be really clear about that. Um, and and something that I love about being part of the EFCA is yes, that Romans five. Sorry. Good job. Well done. Um, so yeah, re, you can read Romans five um, yep. and and sit with why why a literal Adam would be significant for that passage. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that I love about the EFCA is that we don't. Um, I see your next point is unity. Yeah. So, so is, is I do think that we... You said it. you were going to fold it. Sorry, sorry. I'm just kidding. I unfolded it because it was making too much noise to unfold it every time. But um, yeah, yeah. I do think that's a really beautiful thing about um, the denomination that we're a part of is that we really do make an effort to say like what, where is the Bible? Like so, so, so incredibly clear. Um, that's what we're going to unify around. Um, and mm-hmm. and in the smaller issue, I mean, or even maybe, like, what does the Bible say that we should bu- yes, unify around? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Because I think there are some really big issues that are super important, mm-hmm. but the Bible doesn't say that's what you unify around. Yeah, um, and so we have the the ability to disagree with people. Yes, and yes. still be friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, be on the same team. Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I wanted to read a passage um, from John seventeen. If you don't know, John 17 is part of Jesus's upper room discourse. So this is um, the end of Jesus's ministry. It's the end of the gospel of John, even though there's a lot of chapters left. And Jesus is with his best friends that he spent a ton of time with, and he's in a room with them, and he knows he's about to go die, and they're kind of slowly learning this. And Jesus is telling him that different things. He's praying for them. Um, and at one point, he enters into this lengthy prayer to the Father for the people that are in that room and for us as well. And he says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in in me through their message, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So I read, oh, there's, yeah, I'll read the rest. I'll read 23. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Um, And so Jesus has this beautiful prayer where he's looking not only at the people that have been following him, the disciples, the apostles, um, but also us, like the people that would come to follow him in the future. And his prayer was that we'd be unified, be together. Um, And so I think when I was, as I was studying this and researching it, I was aware of it, but it was still tragic in how disunifying it felt. I think even of the other podcast, the cabin conversations. And I feel like one of the goals of that is to to show like what does conversation look like with other Christians when you don't always see exactly eye to eye? Because mm-hmm. um, that can make us feel uncomfortable. And so with this topic specifically, that's what we're hoping to bring out is to talk about how do we not view the other side as an enemy? How do we realize that we're on the same team? And so what I want to talk about was what unifies the different positions? Because that was actually really interesting was there was a lot of unification in what they were talking about. Um, I know you can look at the notes. <laughs> do you have thoughts about it? It's like, I don't know how to include you without while what you, leading at the same time. What do you want time. me to not see about the notes? And I'll pretend I didn't I was curious it. if you had thoughts about <laughs> what maybe in your mind unifies them. But if you already looked, maybe. Oh, yeah. I did already look. Um, or maybe if you look at those things, something that's not on there that you'd bring up. I mean, that's not on there that I would bring up. Um, maybe that's unfair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, Should we walk through these and yeah, maybe yeah. you share some yeah, stuff? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So one of the things that I think... Um, united both sides that I found really helpful was their focus on Jesus. Um, And it's different. Like they focus on him differently on the two different sides, but their focus really is on who Jesus is. And so there's even some uh, resources. I think evolutionary creationists are pretty quick to say this does not define whether or not you're saved or whether or not you're allegiant to Jesus, which makes sense. Um, Or I think creationists 
maybe it seems like they have a little more burden to explicitly say that. And I was actually surprised that a lot of them did. A lot of them said, like, this isn't going to save you or not save you. Uh, they still re believe really passionately about it, but they focused on Jesus is the one that saves us. And I think both sides could come around that and say, like, nowhere in the New Testament are you going to find someone say, um, you are saved by grace through your belief in creation or your belief in evolution. Like, it's just right. not in the Bible. And so I think looking at that and realizing, okay, regardless of how much emotion or how much argument or how much, you know, pen is written about this or typed up, whatever. That's an old phrase. Yeah, uh, wow. <laughs> ink is spilled is the old phrase. Uh, no matter how much they write or how many videos they make, it still goes back to Jesus. And we want to remember that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the second one is the love for the Old Testament. Um, I was, I enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed that both sides didn't devalue the Old Testament because I love the Old Testament. I think yeah, you do too. Yeah, I love the Old Testament. It's important. Yeah, I don't know if you mm -hmm. had any, um, I don't, yeah, any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think wherever you fall in, in this kind of debate, it it does force you to like, dig into and try and have a really good understanding of the Old Testament and its purposes. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I would agree that there's a deep love. Um, and it's complicated. The Old Testament's way more complicated, it seems, than the New Testament. In a lot of ways, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot more literary styles and genres and mm -hmm. characters it's and weird things stuff. happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, now that I'm thinking, I would say it's also a love for uh, God's creation that I would say yeah. unifies both sides. Um, That's really true. Yeah. Uh, I think people on both sides both feel really passionate about the world that God created and they love to study it and mm -hmm. understand it. And and in studying it and understanding it, um, yeah, a lot of people, I think, find that as like a really unique and special way to connect with the creator, with God. So, yeah. yeah. And the other one is that they, um, a lot of their passion is removing the science or religion dichotomy. And so both of them look at it. And, I, and that's where it's weird because sometimes it feels like the sides are fighting each other. And sometimes it feels like they're like shooting someone over their shoulder, if that makes sense. Um, and the way I think about this is it's, it's easy to see it from creationists towards evolutionists. Because oftentimes what I see is that creationists are actually attacking like non-theistic evolutionists and they almost treat theistic evolutionists as like misinformed or uh, misunder, uh, hap not hapless, but like basically allies to the wrong, like, like the enemy of my enemy kind of situation. Like they're not as upset or against theistic um, evolutionists, although they kind of are. It's more their worry is that being a theistic evolutionist is just a step away from being an atheistic evolutionist. Sure, yeah. And so by not believing that God created the world the way it says in the, the six-day account, you're, you'll then start to discount other things. And so that's kind of their fear is that this, um, yeah, sitting in the scientific waters under that framework, under the evolutionary framework, will then rob you of your faith. Um, and I think the opposite of um, theistic evolutionists, what they're, uh, maybe they're like, enemy is, is people who just disengage from science or people who say like, we're just going to read the Bible. We're not really going to study. We're not going to look at the beauty of God's creation. And we're not going to use all of these cool things that, that we've learned to see who God is. We're kind of going to like narrow our focus. I don't know if that, yeah, if that's making sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. I think, um, yeah, I think the critique of like kind of the creationist that comes from maybe like it, like specifically in regards to this concern here is the um, maybe that um, people kind of on the like literal creation side of things maybe straw man or don't fully understand yeah. um, evolutionary theory and like how that interacts with things. And then I think the fear that then comes out of that is, well, the first time that your kids are exposed or the first time that someone is exposed to yeah. um, how evolution is taught or how the Big Bang is taught or whatever, like does that suddenly like crumble their faith essentially i think that's the fear and like critique from yep yeah which explains the methodology yeah um because when you like the creation is so i wish there was a faster way to say this <laughs> um the creationary no the <laughs> evolutionist yeah creation is that what it is i'm like i don't know i've said it so many say, times so I don't know. the <laughs> creationary evolutionist. Yeah. Um, what they kind of do is what their methodology is to try to say, let, let me help explain how 
the Bible could be understood so that what science says and what God did aren't different. Basically, that God used natural selection in order to create the world and how that actually makes sense with what the Bible says. So that when people get to college or in high school and they start seeing these things that they go, oh yeah, you're telling me that means it's natural. You're telling me that means it didn't need God, but I've actually learned that God could have used those things. So it helps them have a framework when they go into it to go, okay, I can still believe in God no matter what you're telling me. And creationists do the exact same thing where they say, um, actually, the, the scientific theories shown you aren't as foolproof as maybe you've been led to believe. And so what we're going to yeah. do is we're going to help show you that when you get told by somebody, hey, God can't be real because of this, this, and this, that you actually have something in the back of your mind going, but that's not 100% true. Like you're, right. you're kind of overstating your position there. Yeah. Um, and so again, both of these positions are trying to say, let's, let's look at things. And that's, that's one of the big things I realized was both of them are interpreting. It's all about interpretation. Um, I know. I remember one of the huge things on the creationist side is they'll say, like, creationists and evolutionists look at the same data, but they're interpreting it differently. So when you get into the nitty-gritty science stuff, which I don't know super well, uh, but when you get into, like, you know, dating fossils or, um, I don't know, carbon dating or isotope dating. I don't know. You probably know the terms way better than I do, so I'll just sound like an idiot. Anyway, when you get into all these things, they're looking at the same data, the same, like, observable things, but they're going to interpret it differently. So they're going to look at it and say, yes, this is what we see there. I know it's kind of hard to talk about it like, vaguely without just bringing up specific examples, but hopefully this, this um, works. Um, and so they'll talk about it like, this is what you see. And then they'll say, that's what this means. And what's interesting. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I yeah. give a specific yeah. example? I think um, a lot of times people who maybe fall under like the theistic evolution side don't mm-hmm. necessarily affirm like and this is beyond Genesis 1, but they maybe don't as- affirm like a literal worldwide flood either. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. So that's that's where a lot of that stuff ends up coming into play is where yeah. um, someone from maybe a secular position or a theistic evolution position will say, look at this thing that happened over millions and millions of years. Um, yep. And then someone coming from like a creation perspective will say, look at this thing that happened when um, God sent the flood. Yep. Um, the Grand Canyon. Yeah, yep. Exactly. And they'll look at Mount St. Helens and say, this is maybe an example of how something could form really quickly. Yep. And an evolutionary creationist would say, nope, like this is layers and layers that was worn by a river over millions and millions of years. And so they'll kind of, and that's where you, what you'll see often is you, when you go into these kind of debates, you see them taking oftentimes science and they sometimes try to leverage the Bible, but a lot of times it's around science and trying to argue about what could have existed or what couldn't have. Um, but I, but it's just interesting that it is all about interpretation because the evolutionary creationist will say, you're interpreting Genesis 1 wrongly, actually. Like, it's poetry or it's against Marduk or, you know, like, it's not designed to do this. And so you're you're interpreting it literally when it shouldn't be. And a cre- creationist will say, well, you're looking at this science and you're interpreting it incorrectly. Mm-hmm. And both of them have the same Bible in front of them and the same scientific facts in front of them but they're interpreting it differently. And that's where I think the conversation about frameworks is so helpful, yep. is that this is interpretation. This is, here's the data in front of you. What are you going to decide? Which is part of the reason why we don't want to tell you um, what to think or how to decide. I think that's a good conversation with your parents, with um, yeah, people that you trust, but it's a, a tricky one. So, Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I think I do want to, because I think what you brought out is like really a really great unifier in that, I think the heart of both sides is to say, like, we don't want, we don't want you, we don't want anyone to lose their faith over this discussion. Um, yep. And and if you're at a point where you feel like you are maybe on the brink of that, like, have a conversation with someone. Yeah, mm-hmm. whether that's your parents, whether maybe it's um, your small group leader, maybe it's Justin or I. Um, probably do maybe a combination of all all three of those kinds of people. Yeah. Um, because because we don't we don't think that this should be a thing that like makes or breaks your faith. We want yeah. we want who Jesus is to be what makes or breaks your faith. Um, yeah, not some of these other things. So mm-hmm. yeah, so that's that's all I have. I don't have an answer. I don't have a. Um, I know it's like kind of anticlimactic. Yeah, if if <laughs> they've listened to any of these episodes before, it shouldn't be a surprise. I but. feel like we'll have more like concrete things later on. Like we have some other ones that I'm really excited about that are going to be more concrete. Yeah, that's true. But this one is so, I think the, the the wealth of knowledge really does make it super tricky because there's no way for us, like I think if you want two resources to go to, um, again, and that's how you can get like nervous because I'm like, I don't know if these are the best of both sides, but they're, I think, emblematic and well-known. And so maybe if they're you- probably the, 
the yeah most well known. Maybe sides. you know. I think I know where you're. Uh, suggest. Answers in Genesis mm-hmm. on a creationist side. They do a lot of stuff like the Ark Museum. Um, and then on the other side, you have BioLogos, um, which I think you're familiar with that. And mm-hmm. so it's, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, can't remember his name. Didn't he do, uh, he did something with genes. Francis. Collins. Collins. That's yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have kind of like the two different camps that can often feel pretty opposed and sometimes they will talk at each other or maybe, uh, they're, unfortunately, they're not super aggressive, but they can be demeaning. And so you can, I would encourage you to listen to both of them, mm-hmm. like to go to both their websites, read up on both um, and try to find instead of, so like this is one of my cautions to you just as you dive into any of these kind of topics that are contentious or that have a lot of different sides to them. Be wary of reading one side's view of the other side. I think a better a better way to do it is to get their own description of what happened. So that's what I tried to do is I tried to go to them and listen to like, how would they describe what they did? And that was even great because I got to hear, that's what I think where I found the similarities. I think if I just gone to one of those sides and looked at what do they believe and what does the other side believe? I don't think they would have said, Hey, we have all this stuff in common. Maybe they would have, I don't know. Um, but I would say, yeah, put the work in to, to do that, but focus on who Jesus is. And I'd even encourage you if you're not going into the sciences and you feel really passionate about this, I would actually, as your youth pastor, say, take a step back. <laughs> um, it, it isn't a, a make or break deal. It's not the end of the world. Um, and so it's not worth hating another person over or fighting with another person over. Uh, but if you're going to go into the sciences, if this is going to be like a continual thing where you got to figure it out, or if you're somebody who's really struggling with your faith because you don't know what to do with this, dig in um, and study. Yeah. So, yeah. Any final words? I don't think so. No. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, you can come find us. Um, this will be yeah next week, and let us know if you have any yeah. questions. Sending questions. We're gonna do yeah, some uh, questions and response, or we'll take your questions and figure it out. So you can email youth at woodlandschurch.org, and we'll do our best to respond to those questions. So if something we said made you like worried or afraid, or you're like, hey, why didn't you talk about this? Or you have some great resources or something, email them to us. And oh yeah, I forgot to say we have to say this tonight. If we use your question, we'll give you a prize. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. So don't don't send us a stupid question. That's true because we won't use it if it's a really dumb question. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean stupid in the fact of like, if you're trying to like, did dinosaurs eat broccoli? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if, I think of a stupid question that's not. Yeah. Yeah. You can send in a question that you maybe are afraid makes you look dumb. That's not. The yeah. Kind of that's that's not the kind of stupid we're talking about. We're talking about. Yeah. A silly. Don't send silly questions. Yes. Send serious questions. Yep. Because you're all serious young adults. Yeah. And that's part of why we don't tell you even necessarily what we think or where we stand on this. Yeah. Because um, we think that you are at the age where you're capable of deciding for yourself. All right. Well, we'll see you tonight. Yeah. And, and Wednesday. <laughs> and what? next Wednesday. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>